many friends, thank you. And uh, thanks to Mike and, and Dave and Lou and everybody for inviting me to, to be up here today and be part of this and talk about something that's really become my life's passion, right? Uh, and my actual passion. I, I didn't intend for this to consume the last 17 years of my, my life and really consume the rest of it, but that's the journey that I'm on and I, I love it and enjoy every bit of it and I want to share it with you. Before I get to that part of my life, though, let's talk about the other part. Um, you know, June 17, 1991, a 34-year-old kid from Aurora sat in a front of a microphone in a studio that was a third of this size and flipped the microphone switch for the first time and said, uh, if nobody has said it to you yet, let me be the first to wish you a good morning. And, uh, and that began the Breakfast Club, my radio program on 1430. Uh, at the age of 34, uh, I had been asked to come down and do the morning show for just a couple of weeks because the station was being sold. We were being purchased by Tribune Broadcasting. And there was little expectation that, that they were going to keep the AM station. It was expected they were going to spin it off to somebody because it was just the small AM station. So, and then I would go down the hall and do the, <laughs> the midday program, the middle of the day on the old KOSI. So uh, I said, sure, I'll do that for a couple weeks. 27 years later, <laughs> I'm still <laughs> showing up in there doing the morning show. Uh, because, uh, because what we all discovered in those early days was there was some great opportunity with that radio station. And it just, however it worked out, I just seemed to be the right person at the right time. Not because I had anything in common dramatically with the listeners. I was 34, the average age of the listener then in 1991 was 78. So it wasn't that, right? And in fact, that it was out of desperation really that I found my connection because what do I share? What do I go on the morning? and talk about on the radio that connects me to the listeners. I, j I decided first family. So I had at the time two middle age, the middle age, middle school daughters. I now have a middle school granddaughter. Uh, but I had uh, two daughters that I shared about what it was like raising them. And so there was a connection. Grandparents who were listening remembered their own children. And then in October of 1991, I got a phone call from a gentleman, some of you will know, a gentleman named Irv Obermeyer. And Irv called me to tell me, uh, and I, I, I was glad I knew, but I was in the Air Force six years, 1976 to 1982. My dad was in for 20 years, so, so military is, in, is certainly in my life. The six years I was in was all peacetime, 76 to 82, nothing happened. I can't join the American Legion because nothing happened. Uh, I can't join the VFW because nothing happened. I can be a son of the American Legion, my dad was in, um, and in fact the Legion has made me an honorary life member, but I was in during a, a time of peace, doing radio that, in Guam. And I loved every second of it. I, the 15 months I had in Guam were among the 15 best months of my life. It was abs and I have since talked to a lot of people who served in Guam during that time and later, who had the f same impression of being there. I suspect in 1944 it was a whole lot different. Uh, and probably not a place I would have wanted to be, but uh, in 1976 and 77 it certainly was. So I have military in my background a little bit. In October, October of 1991, I get a call. It's a gentleman named Irv Obermeyer, and Irv says, Rick, um, this is the 50th anniversary this year of Pearl Harbor. I said, oh, correct, and he said, I was there, and I'm wondering if you would like us to have some other Pearl Harbor survivors come in in December and be on your program, or November and be on your program. They were all going to Pearl for the 50th, so they thought they'd do something on the air before they left. So I said, sure. So they showed up, seven of them. Honestly, the room was, if you took the edge of this wall, this was the size of our studio. From here to there. That's small, right? There was eight of us in there. And one microphone. And I still had turntables in the studio. Remember record players? You guys all remember record players. Come on, you're not fooling me. You remember 78s for crying out loud. So, um, so we're all in this room, and I'm handing the microphone to them as they tell me in a personal audience with a lot of people listening about December 7th, 1941, through their eyes. One, a nurse who had been there, shoved it up to the hospital, right? Dorothy who lived up in Grand Lake. Um, Irv, who was at the sub base. Uh, across the harbor. So um, 
normally at that time people yelled at me a lot because they weren't used to somebody talking to them on the radio. KZW had been that station that played nothing but music and nobody interrupted it and everybody liked that. And then this kid showed up and started talking to him and I would get lots of calls about, why are you talking to me? Just shut up and play the music, would you? <laughs> and, uh, but then I started getting the calls from the widows and the widowers who were home alone and called me to tell me, I appreciate there's conversation in my house again. So I knew that what we were doing was good. So on December 7th, 1941, here comes Irv and the gang. And I let them start and I let them go for an hour and 15 minutes uninterrupted. And as they were going back and forth sharing their stories and as I was talking to them, I was very taken with their stories, but I was more taken watching them telling me the stories. You've had it here where you've had folks come and talk or you've had interviews here. Uh, Eric, uh, Phil and Eric, they know when somebody's there, when they're telling you the story and, and they're so into telling you their story that it, they're actually transported back to that place, they're seeing it as they're telling it to you. And in this room, the seven were all seeing it as they were, and I was, I was very fascinated by that. And it became, from that point forward, my job at KZW became to be a champion, to give them a portal, an outlet to share their experience of World War II, and then for me to become a witness to that service. And a lot of people, World War II veterans, have said, you've walked us, you've helped us make that final walk. Paul Murphy and I used to talk about that all the time. Uh, Joe Cicado, who uh, was uh, a dear personal uh, close friend of mine. Uh, I planned Joe's funeral and his memorial service. And uh, uh, all of them would say, you helped us get down the last part of our journey. And it was important to help them do that by sharing their story that they had kept so locked up for so long, right? The generation that didn't ever talk about it, the first of many. Uh, many of you have not talked about your experiences. So that's how it began for me at KZW. It's gone 27 years now. Um, I keep showing up. My key keeps unlocking the door. And uh, we keep having opportunities to talk about veterans. Started in 1991. In 2000, I was at the American Cemetery at Omaha Beach in Normandy. You've seen it. Many of you have been there. Um, you've seen it certainly at the beginning of Private Ryan, right? The cemetery you see right at the beginning. I was there to do a radio broadcast back to Denver, a four-hour broadcast, where we were paying tribute for a year and a half. That was the kickoff, and for a year and a half, we were going to pay tribute to the uh, World War II veterans of Colorado. Uh, then being almost uh, 55 years, close to 60 years for some, at the end of their war experience, we felt like it was maybe going to be one of the best opportunities, last opportunities, to say thank you to them for their service. So I went to Normandy, I sat, uh, they didn't have the facilities then they have now, so to do a radio broadcast, I had to do it from the tool shed. And the window in the tool shed was broken and they didn't have anything to sit on, so they stacked up three bags of fertilizer, <laughs> which seemed appropriate. My wife got a big kick out of that. Oh yeah, look at you. You dish it out and now you're sitting on it. All right, there you go, that's great. So, uh, so there I was at the cemetery doing my radio broadcast. We had done a bunch of research. There's 88 from Colorado buried there at Normandy. There's 12 on the Memorial Wall of the Missing, 100 from home that are remembered at Normandy. And during the day, visitors started coming into the cemetery, this beautiful place, because it was Memorial Day weekend. And uh, at Normandy, like they do at most of the American, uh, at all of the American Battle Monument ce uh, Commission cemeteries overseas, those American cemeteries that are there, 25 of them around the world that we can maintain to this day. And Memorial Day weekend, of course, they put the American flags and the uh, country flags, the French flag there, were at Normandy. But that day, we placed 88 Colorado flags, one at each of the 88 Colorado grave sites, to remember our fallen. And as I was doing the broadcast, a gentleman came up. The cemetery staff was bringing guests for me to interview. They brought a French lady, couldn't speak a word of English. 
I thought, well, this will be meaningful because I don't speak a word of French. So <laughs> this is, but my nephew was with us, 15 at the time, and he spoke fluent French. Um, his dad worked at, the, the colonel was stationed at NATO, and he, so he'd been overseas most of his life and was fluent. So he became my translator. Now, I suspect he got about half of what she was saying. I don't have any, any doubt he was missing a whole bunch because she was very animated. And what she was telling us was that she lived just off the outskirts of the cemetery still in a little property, a little farm property that, that her dad had owned. And on D-Day, her father had spent the night going out into the darkness and finding downed Americans and bringing them into his barn where she would wrap them in gauze and try to stop bleeding and try to clean them up until, until the Americans got off the beach and into the country and was able to, to liberate where they were. She handed me a piece of gauze and said, this is the last piece from the roll. Right? Wow. So I got to thinking about how they, what it meant to them, that sacrifice. And then I asked this superintendent of the cemetery, how many of these kids buried here, right? Mostly teenagers. How many of these kids buried here have ever had a visit from home? Knowing full well, they have no idea officially, but he said, we estimate about 20% of them have had a visit from home, from family. So that meant to me out of the 88 from Colorado, only about 70 there never had anybody from home come see them. And that was the part that stuck with me, and I'm sure to this day why. Everybody says, why, why did that, I, the thought to me of kids, right? If that was my child, so far from home. Now these families made the decision to have their loved ones buried there. And I was curious about that over the years and have asked many, why did you make that choice? And, and it's, a, it, it's a very reasonable explanation for it. First off, these were not families of means by any stretch, right? These, they, most of the enlistees, the young enlistees, came from, from impoverished families uh, at coming out of the Great Depression. This was, this was not a... So the cost of, of them coming home and going through a burial and going through was one consideration. The other consideration for moms, though, the one that meant the most to me was, they would say, you know, when I got the knock on the door, I went through my time of grief then. To bring them home, I'd have to go through it a second time. So they made the decision to leave them where they were. And that decision caused them a gravesite to go visit. And that was the part that bothered me a whole lot, was them not having that gravesite. So that began my journey. What do you do if they don't have a gravesite to go visit? You try to build something. Aren't these beautiful pictures? Who's, who's been to Normandy in this room? I took both of you there, so I know you were there. <laughs> it is, in my opinion, everybody certainly has their own, in my opinion, it is the most hallowed place I've ever been. I, what I've been able to do that probably nobody else here has been able to do, when I did that radio broadcast, Towards the end of the broadcast, the superintendent of the cemetery came in and said, hey, Rick, when you're done, just go ahead and pack your stuff up. And then he said, I'm leaving, so just pull the gate shut behind you. I said, Gene, you, you're leaving me in charge of the cemetery? And that's a very unusual thing for people to assume I have uh, adult responsibility capability. As I'm not usually given big tasks like this. And he said, hey, I live in the house right over there. Nothing happens out here. Just pull the gate shut. So I said, okay, so we packed up, we got everything in the car, we were getting ready to leave, we were gonna drive to Belgium, it was towards, it was about this kind of light, it was towards sunset, and I stopped. And I turned around and I walked back in before I left. The only person upright in this cemetery. And the birds were chirping a bit, and you could hear the waves in the channel and the wind blowing through the trees, those big pines. And I knew at that moment that I wasn't done with this place. I know now what that meant, right? What that meant was I was going to try to figure out how to bring them home. In 2001, we finished up that year-long tribute to the veterans of World War II that we started at Normandy. I did my radio program December 7, 2001 from aboard the Missouri next to the Arizona at Pearl Harbor. 
What was difficult about that at that time was it was three months after 9-11. And security was pretty incredible. Um, we went through a whole lot of hoops to pull the broadcast off just because they were shutting everything down, understandably so, right? But that day, December 7th, 2001, at Pearl Harbor, the Hawaiian government had invited first responders from New York to come at their expense to give them away from what they had been dealing with for those three months. Give them a little R&R, &R, right? Not unfamiliar to veterans who had been to Hawaii for R&R, &R, now that we were bringing first responders to Hawaii for R&R. &R. And I stood, I was at the visitor center there at Pearl, and I stood in the middle as the first responder group came and the Pearl Harbor survivors were there and these two groups met. And I just turned on a tape recorder and held up a microphone and listened in on conversations that, that I, I run them on the air still from time to time. They were incredible as the first responders realized for the first time, there are people who know what I've gone through, right? These survivors of what happened here know. And so it was really a pretty remarkable thing to be a part of. But we did finish it and I came home and we decided let's build this week. I decided, my wife will tell you the only reason she agreed to this whole idea was because she never thought I would follow through with it. <laughs> she, there is no way in hell he's going to do what it takes to pull this off. So um, 2001, when 9-11 happened, we had actually been up and running a little bit. We packed it all up and put it away thinking this isn't the time. I continued to speak about it. Um, but uh, well, we weren't really raising money till 2005. We decided we've got enough distance, we reconvened the board, we started again, then the economy crashed. Well, great, I've got great timing, I'll tell you. And uh, so we backed off for a little bit longer and then we got it all reorganized and brought back out about 2008 and got really busy with trying to raise money. We knew the memorial was gonna cost us almost a million dollars. I also was committed that the only names that were going to be on that memorial was the names of those that had been killed in action. Our intention was to have the names of every Colorado veteran killed in action since we became a state displayed on this memorial. So that's the Spanish-American War through today, right? And that was our intent. That was what we set out to do. I went to the state archives. I was given a list. Here you go. Here's a starting point. And as I was being handed the list, another hand was shaking my hand saying, and this isn't right. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I've learned a lot about military record keeping, right? Ay, ay, ay. What happened over the years? Spanish American War, 48 from Colorado killed in action. We actually amended the state records because we discovered some that they had lost to, to history. We have a great research team that works as all volunteers to help us with identifying names that should have been on the memorial. So 48 from the Spanish-American War. How were those records kept? Pencil, in log books, and ledgers, written down, wrapped up with twine, brought back home. World War I breaks out. The first of the manual typewriters uh, then, right? So, and handwritten, but so they take the old handwritten and convert it to typewritten. As they look at them and go, is that an I or an L? Uh, L, right? I mean, literally because they were not able to read it. And just so already we're losing track of names. And it continued generation through generation through generation that way, simply because of technology, right? So the list I was handed is, was 5,237 names. I will tell you that now on the memorial we have 6,213 names. So almost 1,000 names that had been lost to history, 100 little over a hundred that have been added from Iraq and Afghanistan. But uh, those names that had, for whatever reason, fallen through the cracks, some intentionally. Um, the Vietnam, uh, for those of you Vietnam vets, you know well, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. has in-country killed in action from Vietnam. Uh, we have in our memorial um, Lieutenant J.G. Buddy Pyatt, who was uh, an aviator who crashed aboard the Enterprise coming back from a mission. Um, when his engine failed and his, his uh, wing hit the deck and he went into a, a bit of a cartwheel and took out two other planes, um, there was 20 some that were killed. They're not on the Vietnam Memorial because it didn't happen in country, but they're on the Colorado Freedom Memorial. You get the front pew.
Come to church late, you got to sit in the front pew. <laughs> you know how it is. That's all right. <laughs> it's always how it is at church. So 6,213. So anyway, I knew I needed a million dollars. I started talking. I started trying raising money. I started going everywhere that I could. What I had determined was, back to the names, I was not going to put corporate names on the memorial. It wasn't going to be the Pepsi Colorado Freedom Memorial. It wasn't going to be the Colorado Freedom Memorial brought to you by Coors. It was going to be the Colorado Freedom Memorial, and the only names that would be there would be those names of Colorado veterans who were killed in action. My name's not out there. And because I was so determined, it took me longer than it probably would have if I'd have just said to Coors, go ahead and put a big brass plaque up there. And, but I was not. So we start raising money. We're now to 2012 Memorial Day. We've been at this 12 years. I'm doing my radio broadcast from Dry Dock Brewing Company in Aurora. I'm familiar with Dry Dock Brewing Company and many of their products. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin DeLang, who owns Dry Dock, is a, is a very dear friend of mine. And so we were there doing the radio broadcast. You can tell it's still the old KZW days in 2012. And we needed, at that point, of the million, we still needed $400,000. I had quietly determined that morning that if we didn't raise it this day, that I was going to just say, you know what, we gave this a heck of an effort. We spent 12 years trying. It didn't work out. Shake hands, call it good. We'll give the money that we've raised to the American Legion or somebody to do work with, and, and we'll walk away. The broadcast was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. At 5 p.m., we had raised $87,000. That ain't close to 400000 And I had decided at that point that my last announcement of the day would be, you know what, we gave this a shot. Thank you, everybody, for who believed in it, we're, and that's that. Five minutes before I'm getting ready to sign off, my wife comes out. She says, uh, don't move. OK. And she's holding a sign. And she said, do you want to see the final total? And I'm like, yeah, OK, whatever. And she turns it around, and it says 400000 And And I'm, I'm honestly shocked. I'm, I'm in a moment of trying to understand what's happening. What I know now that happened was a gentleman we had met a year earlier who was a listener of mine and very wealthy had called her cell phone at about 4.30 and said, how much money does Rick still need? And she said, like, 320 some thousand dollars. He said, I'll give it to you. And she dropped the phone, and the battery popped out. <laughs> so, so now she's crying. She's like, ah! And she gets the battery back in, and he calls back right away. It rings again. <laughs> it's him, and he's laughing. <laughs> and he says, Diane, it's OK. It's all right. So. Um, a guy who, who did well for himself. His father had been a sub commander and had lost his life in uh, Tokyo Bay in World War II, um, not on the memorial, but his wife's uncle had lost his life in Korea, and he is on the memorial. So they had a little connection to it. So he said, tell Rick I'll give him the money. He said, and then tell him to now shut up and start playing some music. <laughs> Remember I told you about that before? So this is the moment Diane turned the board around. And I saw that number, and I realized after 12 years, listen, I've been to more church basements in Denver speaking to senior groups about this memorial and trying to raise money. I've had chicken cooked every way you can cook a chicken. <laughs> I've seen jello jiggle with amazing things in the middle of it that I wasn't quite brave enough to eat, but it seemed like it hadn't killed a generation. I probably should have tried it. I, I, and I would get, at the end of talk, I would get a $10 check and I would say, oh, that's so nice. And I'd leave and I'd get a call from them the next week and they'd say, you know, you were here and we gave you that $10 check and have you started? I said, well, you know, we need a million. <laughs> <laughs> that 10 helped, but we're not quite there yet. And so it went for 12 years. The number of nights in the dark driving home that I thought, what am I doing? And just then a gold star mom would show up in my life and tell me what this was going to mean to her when this was there. 6,200 names, 3,300 of them never came home. 3,300 moms that never had a grave site 
to go to. I've learned a lot about Gold Star Moms and that need for a place to go, right? I was finding out right here, I was finally going to be, and see, there's a cry jar here. Stupid staff of mine. Because <laughs> they know what a baby I am. Groundbreaking. We raised the money on May 25th, 2012. We broke ground February 6th, 2013. Um, Joe Cicado is there. Lots of you up here know Joe. He's right here next to me. Uh, Adjutant General, uh, General Edwards was there, and, and so it goes. And we were out turning dirt as quick as we could turn dirt. And that's the groundbreaking day. And that's me walking up the hill to where the memorial would be. I like that picture. It's, it's me winning after a long time wondering. That was the first sight of, of actual equipment there, doing, uh, doing concrete work. My wife called me and she, I was mad. I was on the radio with you guys and she was out watching the construction. It's supposed to be, that's a guy thing, all right? Ladies, stay out of our stuff. Watching construction is our business. We're supervisors, all right? It's, we're inbred with that. But she sent me that picture to show me what was going on out there. That's the very first concrete peering. This photo replaced a photo of my children in my wallet. <laughs> I, uh, I love this picture. The very first. And then there we are laying the foundation of the memorial. We had wonderful construction crews on site. We would ask uh, the vendors, the, con the contractors, to please hire as many veterans as they could on the job. And we ended up, by the time we were done, with about 92% veterans uh, that built this memorial in honor of the fallen from all those generations. So that's the concrete foundation going in. This was a family project. That's my grandson, who to this day reminds me that I violated many child labor laws by having him <laughs> rake fertilizer at the Colorado Freedom Memorial before sod went down. But we, we were all engaged in this. Where is that located? I'm going to get to that. I promise. <laughs> I think I'm going to do all of this and not tell you how to get there. I'll let you know. So when the memorial was complete, we decided that the panels to us equated to human remains. Those 3,300 that we were bringing back home for the first time since they fell, we felt like we were bringing them home. So we went up to Julesburg with some Patriot Guard riders with an organization called the Federal Protection Agency, with state patrol, with county sheriffs. We went to Julesburg, spent the night in a room that said, do not clean your fowl in the sink. <laughs> I kind of slept with one eye open all night long. <laughs> Who cleans their fowl in the sink? <laughs> uh, but we were up in Julesburg, and, and in the morning, uh, the panel arrived, panels arrived, and we did a Patriot Guard escort from Julesburg to the Colorado Freedom Memorial. We stopped in Fort Morgan, birthplace, not birthplace, home of Glenn Miller, the band leader. We stopped in Fort Morgan. He's on the Freedom Memorial. <laughs> and the elementary school came out to the park and sang patriotic songs when we showed up to greet the, uh, to greet the panels as we came through Fort Morgan. Every street corner in Brighton, there was an officer like that. Many of them veterans, obviously, who served and understood what those panels were as they were coming through town. Every street corner. And then we got out to our place, and there she is, part of her. That sunrise on the day we dedicated the memorial, when we got out there to get started getting everything set up, the memorial, there's Oliver, glass panels falling forward and backwards like men and women falling in combat. Peaked at the top to reflect the mountains, my only contribution to the design of this memorial, reflective of the mountains of Colorado, because I have this romantic notion that for a lot that left and fell, the last thing they saw of home was those mountains. I wanted them in the memorial somehow. The panels move from right to left, Spanish-American War on the far right, first column. Then it goes through World War I, comes to World War II, the majority here, the biggest loss of life, 3,200 from Colorado in World War II. This panel here, you see how it's missing? The MIAs from Colorado, 91 from Korea and Vietnam. 
two have been repatriated in the last year and a half, so we're down to 89. But we couldn't include them with the rest of the names as accounted for killed in action because they're still missing. So we, Christopher Kenton, who designed this memorial, made that panel missing like they're still missing. These last four panels go like this, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, Vietnam. Christopher separated Vietnam like he felt Vietnam had separated our country, right? Christopher was 23 years old when he designed this memorial. Are you kidding me? When I was 23 years old, I, I wasn't doing that, right? <laughs> um, and on it goes. When Chris and I talked the first time about the memorial, he said, Rick, what are you trying to do? I said, Chris, I'm trying to bring them home. It's the only way I can explain it. I'm trying to bring them home. So he took that idea, and if you come out to the memorial and see it in a broader view, there's these stainless steel strips that go through the grass in front. And Chris's interpretation was, the, if you followed those strips, they would take you to battlefields where Coloradans had fallen serving. But more importantly to him, if you followed those strips back, they brought you home to this place. And that was how he returned them from the battlefield in his design. Sunset is a beautiful time to be out there. Now, these are really early pictures because a lot of the landscape has grown up out there now around it all. Dedication day, clean shaven, no earring Rick. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. And there we are at the memorial for our dedication. And there's Joe Cicado. This picture, when Joe passed away, this was the photo every news service used. John Labor took it from the post. We're both laughing, and again, I, this, was, this man was, he's my hero. If there's one man in this world, this is, he taught me so quietly. Joe never set out to, he, to, he set out to teach you, but he would only say like a simple sentence and then leave the rest up to you. And he, I learned remarkable things from him, but we were walking past here, and he had just said to me, those are really old guns. And I said to him, you're a really old veteran. And we both cracked up it, for whatever weird reason. It just, and that was the photo they used. Uh, and then they came. That's the thing you wonder about. You ever do something in your life, you think, man, I'm putting all this work into this. Is it going to matter to anybody? Is anybody going to show up? Right here at the museum, you think that, gosh, we're going to have this great exhibit. We're, we're doing all this work. Is it going to matter to anybody? And, and I wondered that a lot. At this point, there's 16 years, uh, then there's 13 years of my life in this thing. Was it worth it? And then to see this happen at the memorial. We have a photographer from Buckley Air Force Base, which is right across the street from the memorial, who comes over and takes pictures and lets us use them. The USS Denver, their last World War II reunion, they came to the memorial to honor those from the USS Denver that had fallen. Diane took this picture. When we looked at it the first time, it's an optic thing, but you see the current sailors that are behind them there, the five, but look how many are in the reflection. <laughs> right? That's pretty cool. We thought, man, look, the, 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 the ones they're remembering are here, right? Every December, first, second, and third, this will be our third year, we place a luminara for every name on the memorial. The park is four and a half acres, so you're looking at four and a half acres of candles that we light at sunset, each one of them, and then three hours later, we have a second volunteer crew that comes back and turns them all off. But it's, we do it for three nights. We have an elementary school, an entire third grade from Indian Ridge Elementary School in Aurora, Cherry Creek School, the kids come out the morning of the first day and set them all for us. Why? Because they're this close to the ground. <laughs> and I'm not, right? Yes, more child labor law violations, I'm sure. But we teach the kids about service and patriotism. We have Hot Quest come with a bald eagle, and the kids learn about bald eagles. All on their own. And fortunately, the Aurora Television Station was out there to capture it. Two years ago, the kids, they, we were moving them from one place to another. They all stopped at the base of the flagpole and sang the national anthem. Spontaneously, third graders. 
all of the adults that were there were sobbing. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what, oh, there's hope. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what it looks like out there. Because how do you celebrate the holidays, right, at this? I mean, it's not, we can't put Santa up in his sleigh going off the top of the memorial, but this is how we remember that in somebody's life, a season that is largely defined by light, half of these flicker. So as you look across the field, it's like life, life, right? Two years ago, uh, because state legislators love uh, in January on Military Day to do something that they can all be in a photo of saying they support the military, um, they named Sixth Avenue the stretch from 225 to E470, the Colorado Freedom Memorial Highway. So we're we now actually even have a highway. On 9-11 last year, for the 15th anniversary, we had World Trade Center steel at the memorial. We uh, had a lot of people come that day. A lot of first responders came that day, drawn to it. Um, but we had steel there. We actually had two semi-flatbeds uh, with steel. The upper right is a Navy pinning ceremony. We have more events at this memorial now that it's built from the people over at Buckley. Re-enlistment ceremonies, retirement ceremonies. We've had a wedding out there. Uh, we had a Marine Corps service dog retired there. Um, and then the bald eagle I was telling you that the uh, Hawk Quest brings out. Some of the names of the folks that we honor on the memorial, upper right hand corner, Danny Dietz. Most folks here know Danny, it's the most current, right, other than Dave Carter below. CW4 Dave Carter, his wife Laura comes a bit. I get to visit her. He was the pilot of the Huey that, that crashed with the 38 lives lost in Afghanistan. It was Extortion 17 was the mission. He was probably, without question, the best helicopter pilot in the military at the time. An RPG, a lucky shot from somebody on the ground, hit their rotor just as they were landing. And the chopper crashed and all 38 were lost. Middle on the bottom, that's David Sonka from Parker. He and his dog, Flex, are both buried at Fort Logan now, killed by an insider. An Afghan insider turned on them, took both their lives. Over there on the left bottom, that's Hattie Rathel from Colorado Springs, nurse gave her life in World War I serving. She contracted disease from those that were coming from the trenches. We honor her on the memorial. Upper left, Harold Webster, Loveland boy. We think may be the first killed in World War II from Colorado aboard the Arizona. And then in the middle on the top, Roy Munkaster. I love the story of Roy Munkaster, and I'm not, I don't have time to tell you all of it, save that I will tell you this little tidbit. And if you look him up in our database on the Freedom Memorial, you can learn more. He is buried in Scotland, intended to by a Scottish clan, the only American buried in that cemetery. Um, there was a ship that was sunk by a uh, German U-boat right off the coast. He and another guy from Colorado made it to the rocks. They got out of the water, made it to the rocks. Um, the last anybody survivor remembered is the accounts that I've read. He was talking and everything was great and then he saw somebody struggling in the water and he went back out to try to retrieve one more and drowned doing it. Those that died that day were buried in the Scottish cemetery but they were all repatriated save Roy whose mom asked the clan if he could stay and they said he will stay here as a heroic guest. And to this day, the Klan tends to his uh, gravesite there in that Scottish cemetery. I love that story. What does the memorial do now? Look at those faces. This is two years ago. This is last year, 2016. It's the Afghan refuge, refugee family. You know, in Aurora, my hometown, we have lots of refugees and lots of immigrants. We are very much an immigrant town. 64 languages spoken in my town. 64 languages spoken at the high school I graduated from. This family was there. The father brought his children because he wanted them to see how America remembers those that have given the sacrifice. Great thing, right? He wanted his sons to have a little bit of understanding, a little better understanding about this country they were now calling home. 
You can see the little one isn't so sure he's real excited about this, actually, until we put him in the World War II Jeep. <laughs> and we couldn't get him out of the Jeep. <laughs> that was pretty good doings. But now at the Freedom Memorial, not only do we draw families of the fallen and children from field trips and veterans groups and people just passing through. I was talking to a guy from Texas out there last night. But we welcome those who are learning about this place they're calling home. This year's ceremony, the U.S. Air Force Honor Guard and Drill Team from Washington, D.C. In the service drill team competition, Air Force beat every other branch. The Marines, to this day, refuse to believe it happened. <laughs> but it happened. And there they are, the U.S. Air Force Honor Guard and Drill Team. Because this kid had another idea. It took me a year and a half to actually tell my wife I had another idea. Uh, because um, she, she would say after the first one, hey, if you have another idea, let me know so I can beat it out of you. <laughs> so I had this idea, and I still have this idea that we're not done. Uh, the names are there, and I'm, if nothing else happened, that would be wonderful. But I needed to get them a little closer. How do I get them a little closer home? And so I was thinking and thinking and thinking, how do I get them closer to home? And eventually I had this... What about soil from where they lay? Remember I told you there's 25 cemeteries, right, around the world? Coloradans are buried in eight of them, in eight countries. Because the cemeteries are in a few more than that. But there's eight countries where Coloradans are buried. Coloradans are buried in 23 of the 25 cemeteries. Well, I, did, I couldn't get soil from all 23 cemeteries. I didn't want to try that. But what if I got from one from each country? So I got a hold of the American Battle Monuments Commission, which loves the Freedom Memorial. They can't believe these little hayseeds out in Colorado actually pulled this off, you know, because we're not from the East Coast. How could you possibly do that? <laughs> so, but we did it. And, uh, and so I've become good friends with them, and they've been very supportive of the Freedom Memorial. So I, I got a hold of them, and I said, would you support me getting soil from eight of your cemeteries? And they said, yes, we would. And so we settled on the eight. I sent instructions to the eight cemeteries. And I said, here's what I'm after. I'll show you some more of this, and then I can get, there's that drill team again. Pretty impressive. This year, we raised the 10th Mountain Division flag permanently at the Colorado Freedom Memorial. As part of our mission from the beginning, we, we wanted not only to honor the fallen, but we wanted to pay tribute to some of the heroic Colorado related or you know military units so 10th mountain division went up this year with dick over some of you may know dick he may have been here right i'm yeah. sure he's been here um dick who calls me still almost every day i've known dick for a very long time here's the soil so they said yep let's arrange it with the eight but rick we got to tell you it's not going to be easy and i said why is that and they said because you're going to have to get a permit from the USDA huh? to bring soil in from overseas. You know, the USDA wants to know where it came from and does it have any germs in it? Is it going to destroy the crops for future, you know? I wanted a jar full. I didn't think that would create Armageddon, but apparently. So I said, okay. So I got a hold of the USDA. Great. Before you can fill out a permit, you have to have a top secret clearance. <laughs> so they went back to my Air Force clearance from 30 years ago, <coughs> reactivated it, called me, asked me six of the lamest questions I ever heard in my life, and said, okay, you got a clearance. Okay, so I filled out the permit online. The American Battle Monuments Commission said, we don't know too many people get past this part. You got approved. Uh, hey, I'm winning this. And then I get an email from the USDA that says, here are the simple, I still have it, here are the simple instructions you must follow. And 37 pages <laughs> followed <laughs> that email of simple instructions. So what I had to do is I had to provide two airtight, watertight containers in an igloo cooler or something similar. And I had to have copies of my permit in there and I had to ship that cooler to the American Cemetery where they took one of those containers out, opened it, got to the mason jar that's inside it, filled it, put it back in, 
shipped it from their cemetery to the USDA inspection station in Miami, Florida, where they took the one out, took the soil out, baked it at 425 gazillion degrees for a half hour, put it into the second set of containers, and shipped it to me, where I am supposed to report to them every year that I'm still in possession of this soil for the rest of my life. Okay. So I start trying to figure out how much this is going to cost because I'm shipping these to England, Luxembourg, France, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, Tunisia, and the Philippines. Well, FedEx was the only common denominator among all of them. I go to FedEx to get it priced, $5,000. No, no. <laughs> I'm about to go into my backyard and dig up some soil from the backyard and tell everybody, oh, look what I got. So I get a hold of FedEx at the corporate office and tell them what I'm doing, and they said, we'll do it for nothing. This is important. We'll do it for you. So they paid. They actually covered the whole thing. So off it went without any idea what was going to happen. Within a week, the first one was back, France. And then seven made it back, and we were missing eight. Now, I had included in this cooler when we sent it a letter to the USDA inspection team explaining to them what it was they were looking at, that it was soil from Colorado grapes. The one that came back from um, Luxembourg is the soil from all, a sample from all 48 graves of Colorado fallen there. The one that came back from France is from the gravesite of John Buckley, Buckley Air Force Base. These cemeteries really loved what we were doing and went out of their way. So I put in this letter, this is what's coming. The USDA never opened the original jar. They approved it, sent it on through. They didn't bake it. They didn't. So if you ever hear that the corn crop has gone straight to hell, it's probably my <laughs> fault because <laughs> the USDA didn't cook the dirt when it came into the country. Um, but seven came back and there was no eight, the Philippines where the largest number of Coloradans are buried overseas. It seems that the new president of the Philippines thought it would be a good idea to start charging people if they wanted anything to come out of the country. Let's charge you. So FedEx couldn't release the shipment to me without me now applying for a second permit from the Philippine government with a price tag of I don't remember what it was. And it made me mad. And it made the superintendent of the cemetery there mad. And I said, you tell the president of the Philippines to take a short drive over to Manila and go to the cemetery and look at the 867 Colorado grave sites there and tell him we've paid for this soil already. I am not paying for this again. And then nobody from the Philippines would talk to me anymore. <laughs> so they were like, oh, crazy American dude. He's like, uh, oh. So anyway, um, the superintendent of the cemetery decides, I've got to figure this out. And he's sitting in his office. He's an uh, ex-Navy CB. And he looks across his office, and he sees a pencil sharpener. He goes over, and he unscrews it from a little marble base that it's on. He inserts cloth in it, goes out to his cemetery, <laughs> fills the pencil sharpener with soil, <laughs> covers it up, puts it in a box, packs it tight, marks it office supplies, pencil sharpener. Three days later, knock on my door, I've got a pencil sharpener, and I can't for the life of me figure out why the hell I've got a pencil sharpener from the Philippines <laughs> until I open it up and I look inside and I see what he had done to get soil to us. So now we have all eight. It's a great story that I can't tell anybody because I don't want him to get fired, right? <laughs> because cause he's a really good guy. So I told him when he retired, let me know, and then I'll tell Channel 9. But that was the soil. That was it. It came that day. So w the U.S. Air Force Honor Guard had come to officially present the soil to Colorado. And along with the soil came um, the uh, British and the French governments sent attaches to come to represent their countries. Luxembourg sent their ambassador. So we had uh, quite a representation as the soil arrived. We are now having designed and built a permanent niche uh, for the memorial where the soil will rest at the memorial as a part of a display. 
So now I've gotten a little bit closer, right? I've got their names home. I've got soil from where many of them lay home. So I'm getting closer. That's what it looks like in the winter time. We call that photo closing ranks. Because if you look, it's much wider and longer, right? But here it's like they're all huddled, huddled together under the winter moon. Unfortunately, in this day and age, not everybody thinks what you do should go unharmed. And on July 3rd, one of the panels of the memorial was shattered. It was a random act of vandalism, we have no doubt. The police have no doubt. The glass company has no doubt. The insurance company had no doubt. Somebody took a rock, hit the memorial right here. It's about, it's about right here. And the, the panel did what we designed it to do. The, the glass out there is two panels this thick. And in between them is a wafer thin panel of glass on which all of the names were digitally printed. And then it's compressed in between those two thicker outer panels, tempered, so that if anything ever happened to it, it would shatter, but it wouldn't fall. We designed it, because it's in a public park, right? So we designed that for safety reasons. And in fact, as bad as it looks, it's only the face piece that's shattered. The back piece is still all good. But we can't do anything with that. So after I got over being really, really angry, um, that morning and using very bad language for a while. I was grateful my wife wasn't there because uh, uh, those of you who know from following on the radio, Diane's had a couple of strokes in her life and her brain's rewired itself in such that she's very good at a single task. She's incredible. But if you start getting a lot of other stuff coming into the equation, her brain says, let's take a nap. Stroke people who have had strokes or who care for people who have had strokes understand that. It's just, it's part of how your brain rejuggles and resituates everything. But she runs the day-to-day -day operation of the memorial. If you didn't know, if I hadn't just told you, you wouldn't know if she was here that she'd had these two strokes. But I was glad I was there and not her to see this. So, it made me angry. What do you do? Well, what I do is I tell everybody about it in the media. That day, I did seven television interviews, including Fox News Network. It was a national news story on Fox News. Um, Saturday of that week, this was the 3rd of July, so it's Saturday was the 8th, um, we had an open house. I said, I want people to come see what happened to this place. I want you to come here. And people came that morning, and they stayed. The remarkable thing was, we were there for four hours. People that came in the first hour stayed for the whole thing. We weren't doing anything. We were just showing them but they started talking amongst themselves in this community in those four hours raised over twenty thousand dollars before they left uh, all told by the end of the second week third week we'd raised eighty thousand dollars one panel of glass on the memorial that panel forty two thousand dollars it's done by a, a glass company in minnesota called viracon they're the largest commercial glass producer in america for them to do one panel of glass they have to shut down what they're doing where they're doing you know, window jobs for Anderson and for other, with thousands of panels all the same. And now they got to stop, reset everything, retool everything for one piece of glass. That costs a lot of money, right? So, 42 grand for that. Our insurance covered every penny of it. So, the 80 grand has allowed us now to buy a security system, which is going in next week, unfortunately, right? I mean, come on, veterans' memorials used to be a sacred thing, that people knew what they were there for and respected that, and we don't live in that world anymore, sadly, right? So that's our shattered panel, and that's the end for that. The memorial, um, much like, this, like the, the museum here, um, we just exist off of donations from folks. We, we're getting more... Um, organizations uh, supportive. The city of Aurora has been a tremendous help. The first week we built the memorial, we de after we dedicated it, let's see if I can get back up so you can see the, the memorial. I probably, I know Mike, there's a better way to do this, but ah, there, that's the one I wanted. So this, we're responsible for maintaining two and a half of the four and a half acres out there, which includes all of the memorial grounds, the walk up, 
We have flags there of uh, all the branches of the service. Next year, we're putting up the Merchant Marine flag uh, to permanently be displayed there. Uh, the first place, uh, the Merchant Marine Academy thinks we're pretty cool. I think they want to put us on a dollar bill because not the Merchant Marine's been largely forgotten, neglected, overlooked. You had them here. Um, one of the first places outside of the Merchant Marine Academy where by name Merchant Marine are being remembered and they'll be on that new panel of glass when it comes in. So we're gonna put their flag up as well. But th this part here, when we dedicated the memorial, our relationship with the City of Aurora Parks Department was still kind of playing itself out. So after the first week, my wife took our lawn mower and she's gonna do two and a half acres. <laughs> I was at work, so I didn't know this had happened. But she gets out there and she gets started. And the Aurora Parks Department comes to mow the, the lawn. And they see her and they go running over there. Well, stop! Stop! They're, they're afraid this old lady's going to fall over in a heap, I'm sure. And ever since then, they've mowed our lawn. So I told her she was brilliant in her strategy. It really played out well. Uh, they remove the snow, they, they mow the grass, and, and we take care of everything else out there, just on, on donations like everybody else does. We continue to find names. Um, when we put the new plan panel up the week of October 30th, when the new panel comes in and goes up, we will, for the first time since we dedicated it, have everybody there that we know of. That'll last about a week, because then we'll find somebody else we didn't know about and nobody else knew about, right? So our work continues, but... That's our place, that's our story. That's our, your memorial. Every county in Colorado has a name on this memorial, right? The right names are on this memorial. Women, only one uniformed female, Faith Hinckley, from down at Monta Vista, died in Iraq. Um, she's the only uniformed, but there are many nurses that, are, that we honor here. Any questions, anybody got anything you wanna? Yes, sir. Now I'm gonna get it. That wasn't me. <laughs> so, the official address for this memorial is 756 Telluride, but if you put it in your GPS, your GPS tries to take you about 10 miles away from where it is. So, here's how you go. You, from here, I'll do it even from here. Just go to I-225, right? Just take yourself east to 225, drop, or you could go to airport. 225 down to 6th Avenue, Get on 6th Avenue and go east. Go past Chambers, go past the airport. You're going to Buckley Air Force Base. So take 6th out to Buckley. The stoplight before you get to the uh, uh, west gate of is, is Telluride. If you turn left there, the memorial's right there. 756 Telluride Street is officially where it is, but yeah, it's just 6th Avenue down. Now, once you've been there, you know the shortcuts. You can take I-70 to airport and just take airport all the way down to 6th, and you're practically right there, but that's where it's at. It's, you can come anytime. It's lit at night. Beautiful at night. Sunset's my favorite time to go out there. Always has been. You could, because you can see the mountains from up there. So you see the sun setting over the mountains. Maybe not the next couple days, right? <laughs> but, uh, but you can see the sun setting and uh, it's, it's really beautiful. There you go. Beck Recreation Center is a good way to do it. Yep. Yeah, this is really kind of weird that the memorial is here because Diane and I, our first date was senior prom. Our senior prom was in the building right next to the memorial. Our wedding reception was in the building right next to the memorial. So it's kind of weird that all these real big things, I'm convinced she's going to bury me right behind <laughs> that memorial. When I leave, if you ever want to visit me, I'm certain she's going to put me back there. And I'd be okay with that. I'd be all right with that. Anybody else? No. Yes, sir? The designer. Yeah. How was the process? So we, um, because we had no idea what we were doing, we talked to one guy and we liked his design and we hired him. Um, you know, b being that it was privately funded and everything, we probably had some liberties at the time that we wouldn't have if we were a city government doing this or if we were. Um, but we now we showed his we showed his initial design. Uh, at the time, it was going to be at the Lowry, uh, out at Lowry is where it was originally going to be located. But as the space up there started getting swallowed up and as our fundraising was going slower, 
it just, it, the land became too valuable for them, honestly, to let us. But we had showed them the memorial design. We had run it uh, past uh, some art people we knew. And uh, yeah, we settled on Christopher's design. And to this day, knock on wood, we've had one complaint in four years about the design, which I'm sure it's not everybody's cup of tea. But what we intended to do was design a memorial that didn't look like every other memorial. We wanted something that wasn't this traditional military stone, alphabetical order, chronological order. You know what I want you to do? I want you to come here and understand war is chaotic. The names are not in alphabetical order. There's a directory here, and there's now a computer kiosk over here where you can look up a name, and it'll tell you which panel to go to. But the intent was we wanted you to understand war is chaotic. This whole experience is chaotic, so we wanted that chaos reflected in the, in the memorial. It's a bit why the last four panels are not in chronological order. Again, it's that, that chaotic fashion of war. So, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of cool things to it that uh, obviously you're looking at it this big. When you go out there and see it, it's pretty cool. Yes, ma'am? I have a suggestion. The next time you have one of your dedication ceremonies, Every May. why don't you invite some of our <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, we try to keep politics pretty far out of this place. It's, uh, you know, it, it's like being on the radio, and I know there are radio programs dedicated to annoying the crap out of you politically one way or another. There are conservative hosts and liberal hosts. I'm at a radio station where we play music, and I tell my entire staff, do not talk about politics. The minute you do, half of the people who listen to you hate you, right? There's, you don't win that game, unless that is your game, and it's not what we do. And here, this is meant to be a place of comfort. It's meant to be a place of connection for families of the fallen. We have, we have people that come every day who know people on this memorial, and the intent is that we give them a place to grieve at whatever stage of grief they're at, right? That's what this is about. Uh, I, there's a word I hate, closure. People say, wow, that'll bring you closure. No, it won't. How, 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 what? What we say is we won't bring you closure, but we'll bring you closer. Uh, it's being repaired now. We got it ordered actually this week. To, to our <laughs> sort of good fortune, once our blood pressures all came down and the insurance company said, sure, we'll pay for it. Um, to our good fortune, that panel was the only panel on the memorial that didn't have anything on it. No, no, no. It's the only one that didn't have any, it's a perfectly plain piece of glass. It was a placeholder, basically, for a time later when we could raise enough money to buy a panel with all the names we've been discovering to put on it. So what that allowed us to do was to add 147 names that we had discovered since we dedicated the memorial, and those names are being added to that panel and put. So when I say for the first time since we dedicated it, we're able to have everybody there, it's because we're putting them on that panel, those names that we've discovered. So, so we took a long time. It feels like a long time. It's really not. It was July 3rd, so that's three months, right? So that. Uh, well, the week of the 30th, it's gonna, they're gonna, they've scheduled delivery, and we're going to meet it at Julesburg. We're going to escort it down again. We're doing a similar thing that we had done. We should build a stop in here. That would be kind of cool. Come down the highway and stop here. That'd, be, that'd just hit me. That'd be kind of cool, right? We could do something here in the parking lot? Hmm. Hmm, I'll get back to you on that. Hmm. Will, you, will the mayor help us? Will he? Sure. As long as he's got his campaign button on, sure. <laughs> when, when's this due to come? It'll be the week of October 30th. We're not sure exact. We'll get it. We'll get a day actually this week that will be. So I'll let you guys know. That'd be kind of cool though if we came straight down the highway and pulled off and. All right. Yeah, we could do something here in the. We could have donuts and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Not these, though. Don't save these. We'll get some fresh ones. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so that's. Uh, so it is ordered in the. Like I said, the security system is, has been designed and it goes in next week. 
um, the, the television station said, hey, we want to do a story on the security system. And I said, why? So everybody knows what our security system is? <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't think. And they were like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah here's our security system. Everything you need to know. Yeah. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Where did you find the young man who designed it? Great question. So I was at a Baptist church doing a talk about the Colorado Freedom Memorial and a, and a young lady, older lady in the back of the room raised her hand and she said, Rick, what does the memorial look like? Well, I hadn't thought about that part. <laughs> Probably if I'm telling people I'd love them to donate, they ought to know what it looks like, right? And I said to her, I'll get back to you. And so I left that meeting and a couple of days later I was out at the wing over the Rockies, the Air and Space Museum out at the old Lowry and the hangar out there, talking to the guy who was the director at the time, and I was, he was a friend, and I was telling him, man, I got, wh who, where do you go to find somebody who designs memorials? And he said, you know, I just had a kid in here wh who had plans for what we, we could do to hangar number two out here. He said he was a really bright kid, and he gave me his card. That was how it happened, just, just like that. And, and so I called him, and his little voice answered, hello? And I said, uh, is your dad there? And <laughs> he laughed it like that. And he said, no, just me. And I said, Christopher? And he said, yeah. And I thought, oh, crap. I got a 12-year-old designing my memorial. So I told him what I was up to and everything. And he said, well, I'm going home for Christmas vacation. When I'm done, when I come back, let's get together and talk about it. I said, OK. He got back. He called me. He said, it's done. I said, what, what's done? He said, the memorial. I said, no, 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 we talked about 45 minutes on the phone. Well, that's he said, no, it's done. I said, okay, so we got together the next day. So we set up a place to meet. I'm there waiting, and in walks this guy who looks like he's 12 years old. Now I'm really screwed, right? Oh, this is not good. And he comes walking in, he comes walking over. We say hi, he opens up his sketchbook, and that was there. Wow. Has not changed at all from his original design. And I said, how did you, how, well, he said, well, he said, when you told me you wanted to bring them home, I knew what this was. He said, and then what I didn't tell you was my grandfather was a POW in World War II. My dad flew jets in Vietnam. So I, I know this, 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 you know. So he said, I had a sense of it, and boy, he sure did. Well. Now, I will tell you. If you ever have an idea to build a memorial or anything out of glass and put it in a park, stop. <laughs> this is, the vandalism part aside, this is the number one target of every passing bird in Aurora. <laughs> Big birds. <laughs> if they're not sitting on it at times, it, it, when we built this, it was prairie dogs. Oh, that was all it was. It was really ugly. And the park said, hey, we've got a piece of land. Maybe you'd want to go build it. And I said, well, I'll go take a look at it. And I pulled up and I looked at it. What in the world can you build here? It's, it, was, it had a water drainage area in it. And it was tumbleweed and prairie dogs. And, blah. and I'm just about to leave. And two F-16s came right over from Buckley. So I got myself I said, I'll take it. Right? <laughs> Because that just seemed to be, wow, if that happens out here, and it does a lot. We get a lot of flyovers, you know, not intended. The four years we've been out there, they've only actually flown over once when we've asked them to. Um, so we don't get any preferential treatment. But the adjutant general spoke at our, at our ceremony this year in May. And he said, and he's an F-16 pilot, and he said, I will tell you, this place means an awful lot to those of us that flew past it leaving and coming home and we saw it and we knew it was here and it means a great deal to us so th so right it maybe it took so long because it needed to take so long for us to be in the right place right so we had air force one come over like eight times they were training we thought what it, is the president flying that thing what the heck's <laughs> going on they kept going around and around and it was the crew they needed some training hours um, and so they came out here and they were doing touch and goes at Buckley. And then it, that's a big thing to touch and go, right? So when it was coming off the end of the runway, we're across the street. We're not far away. So yeah, Sue was out there with a group of ladies and that was quite the thing. All right, so I guess well, you want to, yes, sir.
Yes. Yeah, and, I, and sometimes I mention that and sometimes I don't because, you know, people have their own feelings about stuff. I will tell you, and I said it in my comments at the memorial this year on Memorial Day, I am convinced that if you go there and sit for a bit and let it, this place will get inside you. I am convinced without question that this is a living memorial and that it continues to ask for other things, for other ways to honor. I Frankly, I think in things that we've done and things that we're planning to do, we kind of re are redefining what honor and memory and, and paying tribute, how it happens. We, it's, and I say that, and, it, you know, I, and I know I say that, I, I say that to my dad. My dad's like, yeah, okay, you're sure out there with a six-pack. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> dad, I'm not. If you know my father, that would be... No, there's, but I know it because Gold Star moms tell me that. I know he's here. The first time I heard that, I had to walk away from the Gold Star mom. She was smiling. I was crying. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I know he's here. Sherry Bush, who lived not, lived not far from here. Her son buried in Northland, not far from here. Andrew Rydell. Sherry Bush said, Thank you for giving me a place to leave my tears. This place, it's that place. There's, so yeah, the whole James Earl Jones thing. In fact, the week after we dedicated, I had my James Earl Jones moment. 10 o'clock at night, I was at the memorial, making sure the lights were. You know, I'm that guy. Irv Obermeyer told me, because he helped build the World War II memorial down at Kettering Park. He was in, in uh, Littleton. He was part of, the leader of that. I thought it was the coolest thing. He had a key to the flagpole, and every day he went and raised the flag. I'd say to him, Irv, when I retire, I'm going to have a key to the flagpole. <laughs> well, I've got a key to eight flagpoles now, so I way surpassed Irv. But uh, I, I just used to think that was the coolest thing. But I was out there making sure the lights were lit at night, and I was all by myself, and it was the first week after we had dedicated it, and I was all full of, look at this! And taps started playing. Now, what the hell? I'm the only one out here. And it's taps, and it's getting louder. And I'm thinking, well, I'll, it, there is music when they come to take you away. I'm figuring out, oh, that's the end of me. Maybe I should just lay down now and wait for, and then it occurs to me, it's 10 o'clock, and at Buckley, every night at 10, they play taps. And it comes across 6th Avenue, clear as a bell. But then I got, so that was my James Earl Jones, yeah, yeah, Rick. <laughs> but it, twice a day the National Anthem plays, right, at, the, at uh, the start of the day and at the end of the day, and plays at night. So again, just a really, another really cool reason for this to be there. All right, so let's do this, because I know we need to do this. Um, just talk amongst yourself, have some coffee, is there coffee and donuts oh, yeah. and all that? And I'll hang around for a little bit if you want to say hi, and I really appreciate the opportunity, Amy sharing this story with you and thanks for listening and go Broncos. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And this is a token of ah, appreciation. One of our music yes. challenge cards. Thank you very much. And I know for many of us who have yet to visit it, that's right on our list now. You know what? me now all right so you guys should organize something right do you, i don't know that you do field trips from here very often but why don't you know if you guys wanted to bring a group out there i'd meet you out there and give you all a personal tour of that place i'd be delighted to do that so yeah i i would really it would it'd mean a great deal if you came out and i could i could do share the place with you